Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone to the Wednesday, May 5th, 2021 work session of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors. I wanna call the meeting to order here at four o'clock. Uh, our first item of business is public comment. And uh, Melinda, I don't know if we have anyone signed up for public comment, but before we would uh, see if that is the case, I just wanted to make note for the members here, if you haven't uh, heard by now, many of you might have, but uh, Westminster Mayor Herb Atchison uh, resigned his seat at the council meeting uh, earlier this week. And uh, Herb is one of those folks that I've always looked up to here on the board since I joined. I think he came on as a director in 2014 uh, as after he had been elected mayor of Denver. But uh, as many of you know, Herb had a long involvement in public service in the city of Westminster. Uh, I got to know him actually when I was at RTD working on the Eagle project, the train, uh, the commuter train out to the airport and up to Westminster and out to Arvada Wheat Ridge. And I uh, had long respected uh, Mayor Atchison's uh, knowledge and his involvement, uh, especially in transportation issues. And his input has been very valuable to this board. And personally, I will miss him very much here. And uh, so I wanted to thank him for his service and uh, make note, I think he was on the planning commission in Westminster, uh, uh, several decades of service to that city. Uh, he was a former board chair as well uh, for Dr. Coggs. So uh, thank you, Mayor Atchison for your 40 years of public service to Westminster and to the region and to this body. Uh, with that said, uh, uh, Melinda, do we have, uh, thank you, uh, Jim and uh, George and everyone else. Um, Herb, I don't think Herb is here. I think, is Anita here? Is Anita Seitz here? I don't see on the list. Uh, Anita Seitz is his uh, alternate, so I imagine she will be attending these meetings. Uh, she's been at the last few. Uh, we, wish, uh, we wish Herb the best uh, going forward. Uh, Melinda, do we have anybody signed up for public comment? Uh, to my knowledge, we did not have anyone reach out prior. And then obviously, if there's anyone now, they can raise a virtual hand. Uh, I also do see that we have one phone call listener. If you're here for public comment, you'll just hit, need to hit star nine on your end to raise a virtual hand. And we'll call on you based on the last three digits of your phone number. OK. We have 14 attendees. I don't see anyone raising their hands and the person on the phone has not done so yet. Um, so I'll give it about five more seconds. Okay, uh, let's move on to item three on the agenda, which is a summary of the April 7th uh, board work session. Uh, assuming that you all have had a chance to review them, uh, just let me know and or Melinda know if there are any corrections or addenda to that uh, uh, work session minutes. And I don't see any hands for that item. So we will consider them uh, approved and we'll move forward with the, uh, the long awaited and delayed. And thank you, Brad Calvert for uh, your forbearance uh, with some other items that uh, emerged that prevented this from being completed. Uh, but Brad Calvert is going to uh, uh, continue the discussion of the Metro Vision uh, ideas for amendments. And Brad, are you ready to take over? I am, if I can figure out how to hit that unmute button. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, actually, you're gonna, you're gonna hear mostly from my colleague, uh, Andy Taylor on this item. Andy's the manager of our regional planning shop, but I was just gonna do a little bit of sort of framing and context for the item, uh, given as the chair mentioned, it's taken a little while for us to actually get to this, uh, uh, this, this topic. Uh, again, um, as noted in, in the memo, um, this actually began uh, as an item in February. Uh, staff provided kind of an overview of sort of how we were going to approach a potential amendment uh, to the Metro Vision Plan. Uh, and then we continued that uh, in, in March, uh, also at a board work session, focusing as we will today on uh, staff proposals around uh, amendments to, at the sort of objective and outcome level uh, of the plan. Uh, and that just as a reminder for, for folks that maybe are, are new to this, this type of conversation uh, and Dr. Cog's strategic uh, planning framework, uh, when we use the term outcomes, what that really means are sort of region-wide aspirations that describe the desired future state. And then in our sort of terminology objectives uh, identify continuous improvement activities needed to achieve 
of those outcomes. So I, I know some folks have not been along for the for the strategic planning uh, ride here at Dr. Cog. So I wanted to kind of do some definitional uh, things up front. Uh, and then just a few other things uh, before uh, I hand it off to, to Andy. Um, uh, as noted by the chair, there've been some sort of stops and starts uh, with, with this item. Uh, so in, in the materials in particular, uh, uh, attachment one, which was a video that we prepared to help with this item and attachment three, which is a red, red line document, which you can actually see on screen now that Andy will primarily use to walk you through uh, the material. Uh, you'll see pretty consistent reference to an upcoming action uh, on the MetroVision uh, Regional Transportation uh, Plan, the 2050 uh, MVRTP. As you all know, uh, the board actually took action uh, on that plan in April, uh, but, but we've sort of kept the materials the same uh, uh, for this item so you didn't have to re-prepare uh, uh, as it were. Um, uh, as a sort of um, a noted, uh, because we we're sort of focused on the outcome and objective level, uh, we have pretty consistently kind of guessed uh, that when it comes to seeking alignment between MetroVision uh, and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, the most likely uh, thing that you would see as a recommendation from staff would be to elevate uh, a, a transportation uh, safety uh, objective to kind of a standalone objective. Uh, that would also uh, allow for new supporting objectives uh, informed by taking action on Regional Vision Zero, uh, the plan adopted by the board in June of, of last year. Uh, since the RTP was adopted uh, last month, um, our staff that led uh, the development of the RTP uh, reviewed the two plans, both the MetroVision plan and the recently adopted RTP, and found significant alignment between those two documents. That was what we were expecting, uh, but it's always good to do a, a fresh review. Uh, it's always helpful. Uh, as noted, we still anticipate a staff uh, amendment at some point uh, where we would propose, again, uh, elevating uh, an objective related to transportation safety. Uh, also, there will be future conversations around uh, transportation related performance measures uh, and initiatives. That, but those will be future conversations uh, for the board. And then finally, uh, just one last sort of error I caught this morning while kind of prepping for this item. Uh, in attachment three, uh, that red line document that you see on screen, uh, we uh, ultimately, that document kind of pulls out the outcomes and objectives uh, from the MetroVision plan. And when we summarized potential amendments uh, to the theme uh, of a connected and multimodal region, uh, we just happened to notice that we accidentally left out the word safety. Uh, that's an important part of that summary, uh, but just know we do intend that to be a transportation safety uh, related uh, objective. So I just wanted to mention that since that was an oversight that we didn't catch until I looked at uh, this morning. Uh, to prepare for today. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Andy. I'll stick around and obviously um, chime in with any uh, questions or discussion that might be helpful uh, as you uh, discuss this item a little bit later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad. And also, is it possible to go full screen on that and enlarge it a little bit? And I, I hope no one's watching this on their iPhone as well. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it on a 17 inch screen. It's, thank you. That's Yeah, uh, I can definitely enlarge it. Um, I got you. Uh, That's very good. We orient some exactly. things on here, but yeah, I am um, for folks who want to follow along when I'm uh, mentioning things in this red line version, the, the version I'm working from is the same as the packet itself. So I'll also have page numbers in case that's easier uh, that relate to um, the, the pages that are in that packet to follow along. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I'm Andy Taylor, as Brad said. Um, I'm, I'm Glad to come back this month and continue the discussion about potential amendments to MetroVision. Um, as Brad mentioned, um, he kicked us off in February by introducing the scope of these potential changes. So I'll reference that process um, and uh, how these other plans are potentially informing MetroVision. Um, we continued that conversation in March and got about a third of the way through our material. Um, and so I'd like to revisit that a little bit and then also uh, discuss the remaining material. But based on what we heard, uh, we wanted to present uh, these outcome level changes and objective level changes in some more accessible and dynamic formats than what um, I think what we heard about the PowerPoint slides that we began with in March. Uh, so we recorded a video that allowed us to show those connections uh, with some additions and strike throughs and moves and some narration just to to show how things were moving and connected better than we could in PowerPoint. Uh, we also provided this red line uh, document that I'll be focusing on today. And I'll be bouncing between that and uh, some, some uh, polling slides as well um, so that we can focus on feedback as much as possible. 
Um, I'm just gonna, Brad mentioned already uh, where we are, the current level we're at. This is uh, the strategic uh, framework for our work at Dr. Cog as an organization that we also use uh, for uh, MetroVision itself. And so the level that we're working at right now that we're, we're uh, hoping to get some feedback on is this outcome and objective level. Um, the conversation later, uh, we can get further into uh, performance measures and targets. We definitely intend to that with that, especially uh, given uh, MetroVision a regional transportation plan and the, the move out to 2050 uh, from 2040 as our horizon planning horizon year. And also strategic initiatives will be something that that we can spend more time on once we have some clarity at this outcome and objective level. Um, so I'm going to switch over to Mentimeter here and just uh, mention that uh, we did receive some initial polling. We made it through two of the five other plans uh, that uh, uh, that we were going to look at for potential alignment with MetroVision and, and how it could be reflected in MetroVision. Uh, as Brad mentioned with the regional transportation plan, that's the, the sixth item here that we will get to uh, later, but not uh, not yet today. And so the references might be a little confusing um, in the material, but that was uh, what the board took action on last month. Um, I just wanted to throw up the, the, um, the polling results from last time about as this is about as far as we got last time. Um, I'll go ahead and touch base on these items again in the red line version and go ahead and re-poll this just in case there's different folks on the line or you have a different understanding now. Um, this, uh, just as a reminder, this is not any type of official action uh, through this poll. This is just to help us understand where we may need to spend some more time uh, uh, revising or investigating uh, based on the feedback that we hear uh, in this meeting. Uh, the first two moves you'll see here were related to the state water plan um, and i'll get into that and the other two here uh, were related to um, some restructuring options informed by the state resiliency plan uh, which would help us slim down the safe and resilient natural and built environment theme um, and then create some other logical connections elsewhere in metro vision so we'll take a look at the red line and then come back uh, to re-poll I'm going to go to page 13 um, towards uh, top of page 14 uh, to start. The first change um, that we proposed was actually related to water use and water supply. Uh, we wanted to put that material alongside the agricultural capacity uh, objective and outcome. So um, we wanted to reflect the strong connection of both water and land use to the extent of growth and development in the region. So we also uh, saw this connection between water and agricultural capacity, as well as agricultural capacity um, to where you can see it here. We are in this section related to an efficient and predictable development pattern. We are under this outcome related to uh, growth and development and how we grow. And so these are are connected uh, in the ways uh, we're trying to uh, strengthen that connection in the types of initiatives that could uh, come out of this work. Um, so I'm going to switch to um, 18 to show where some of those were coming from. Um, you'll get a preview of some of the other changes we have yet to discuss here. Um, here's where uh, water use was previously. It was about it was in the section about water quality, and we feel like it has a more natural uh, alignment with uh, some of these things related to agriculture because that is um, one of the major trade-offs uh, with water use uh, that, that we see uh, in uh, the water, state water plan. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the other major changes that we that we discussed last, uh, I guess, in March um, was related to uh, uh, open spaces. So this objective related to protecting a variety of open spaces. Uh, we've proposed to move that, and this, and 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 we would we would unfortunately lose this outcome. Um, and I will explain where this other objective would go to. So you got a preview of that back on page 13, 14 area, um, where uh, we would potentially also move this open space objective to also be related to our extent of urban development, putting it alongside 
these other uh, objectives related to how we grow as protecting land um, has a direct connection to how else how otherwise we're using it. Um, back to 19, the other piece there that you'll see is um, this connecting people to natural resource and recreational areas. That also has a logical place to live. Um, outside this section, we already have a place um, about healthy, inclusive, and livable communities under this outcome about the built natural environment supporting healthy and active choices, connecting people to natural resource and recreational areas. Uh, we see also a logical nexus here um, since uh, original drafting of the plan, there's even some overlap here in these supporting objectives about expanding the regional trail network. Um, so that was the other um, piece that we had discussed last time. And so I will go back to Mentimeter. And so we'll go ahead and re-poll um, the, the, the changes related to these first two plans. And um, for those who participated last time, um, feel free to open up a window, whether it's on the device that you're watching on or on another device, or open up a new tab, go to menti.com. Uh, we've got a code here. It'll be also be at the top of the screen on the following slide. So feel free to join us if you don't hop on it right on this slide. Um, but uh, the code is 31609958. So that'll allow you to see the polling questions as we go through and participate. Has everybody been able to do that? If you're having trouble, raise your hand uh, if you need to wait. And don't see anybody, don't see anybody having trouble with it. All yeah, right. The, the, the instructions are, are here again at the top uh, of the, the screen here. Just a reminder, this isn't any type of binding vote or anything like that. We're just trying to get some feedback um, to help us know where to focus our, our time and attention here. Got some votes coming in. Director Mulvey, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question about the third item, which is the moving of the open space. Go ahead. The current provision of the open space, um, the first one, protection of open space, looks like it, when moved, it was shortened and changed and would you be able to summarize how it was changed or whether it was changed with significance sure um i might have glossed over this um the the change that we um go back to 14 here um this piece here this objective about protecting a variety of open spaces this would stay the same. The piece that has dropped from this section, um, let me see, is just the um, outcome language that, that came before it. So there was, there was an outcome and a little narrative under it. Um, that's the only piece that would have, that would have been dropped. Um, the, um, this piece about, um, let me go back to, it's the part that's dropped that I'd like to focus on, please. Yes, it's so it's this piece here that would potentially be dropped. Does that appear elsewhere? Uh, it, it would not under this proposal. I'd Can like to register off? concern about that okay. because yeah. in some of the Denver Metro area, we try very hard to preserve some of that open space 
by ensuring that new development has, you know, we, we have density in some parts, but then preserve open space on a net level um, in a development, whether it be a commercial or a residential development. And, and that would be consistent with some of the region's interest as well in promoting you know healthy living so i'm a little concerned about dropping that completely okay and andy can you take the highlighting off that so it's easier to yeah. read yeah. thank you yeah so it's, it's this paragraph here um that would would potentially be eliminated and this these other sections would go into different places these other objectives I could see if there's a rationale that I'm perhaps not connecting with or if it's moved somewhere. Maybe that could be clarified. Okay. Brad, Brad, you want to weigh in on this? Uh, yeah, thank you, Director Mulvey. And I was actually uh, sort of thinking of something that you just said. Um, one of the things that we aren't presenting in this are narratives that are sort of introduce each theme uh, and there are there is some language already within that theme narrative that gets to some of these issues, but we could we could think about bolstering that to make sure that some of these key issues that you're bringing forward um, aren't lost. We can certainly amplify uh, those points so that so that that's not lost uh, as sort of an introduction into the overall uh, theme and why those issues are important. Thank you. Director Director Shaw, did you have something on this also? Just and I think Brad addressed it that if if staff has the opportunity to look for another area where we can tie open space and healthy living and recreation and beautiful environment that would be lovely <laughs> okay thank you uh, director mulvey uh, i'm sorry to interrupt you go ahead uh, thank you the particular um focus on mental health physical and mental health and wellness I, I know that does appear in another area, but connecting that with protection of open space, I think would, would be an important outcome, particularly since this plan is often used as a supporting document for a lot of the programs for the funding. And that is most definitely a lot of the rationale for the programs and the funding, particularly now. And, I, and it's often really a huge goal of our population and our legislators. I just think that it's really important to continue to keep that in there in particular too. Thank you. Yeah, this, Thank you. Is, this is definitely a uh, language that I know the board at the time spent some time crafting and, and reworking. So um, I, I think that's definitely the kind of feedback that we can use to help figure out where we can still include this and if it still works with the reorganization. Uh, that we're proposing so thank you it's still an outcome that we want correct but uh, director dale go ahead yeah i was thinking that first sentence is very useful it includes mountain backdrop and those things and so i think we could just cut that first sentence and paste it in because you, if you look at mountain backdrop prairie landscapes riparian corridors um, at, at least that much not, it, not even including other open space areas is, is real important so regardless of where you're worried about national parks or BLM territory or just our open space like we have in Jeffco, I think that's a valid point that's been raised. I don't think it hurts to bring a, make an outcome a little bit longer since in the Air Force, I wrote a lot of these type of things, holy cow. All right, thank you. Thank you, Director. Andy, go ahead. It looks like we've we've gotten about 21 responses. I haven't seen any new ones come in. So um, thank you for the feedback on this and thank you for that specific feedback. That was really helpful. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the red line. Uh, if there's still votes coming in, this will still stay on that slide. So I'm gonna go back to the red line version over here. I am going to, luckily, uh, most of what we're looking at from here on out is primarily about additions. So not as much about the moving and shifting in and what we might be losing. So I'm gonna go back up to page 18 here. Um, 
you had a presentation back in March on the state's greenhouse gas roadmap. And so we wanted to try and reflect that in this uh, portion here about uh, clean air, water, and lower greenhouse gas emissions, this outcome. Um, what we're proposing is to break apart what's currently an objective about both air quality and greenhouse gas emissions to give the greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction piece separate billing, uh, if you will. And so um, it also gives us the opportunity to add uh, some of these supporting objectives that you see here um, that are largely language taken from uh, the, the uh, state's roadmap, uh, but things where we saw a nexus between local potential local and regional action uh, where we could note that in Metro Vision. So that's one change that we're going to uh, pull on here in a minute. Um, Director Maurer. Um, thank you. Um, and thanks for the presentation. And um, when we're talking about those supporting objectives and the bullets there, I'm just wondering if on the very last bullet we could add goods. So increase the efficiency of food and good distribution. Would that be possible? Yes, um, that right now is um, uh, a supporting objective that we're uh, proposing to move from what was formerly under the agricultural section, but uh, that would be a good addition based on where it'd be moved to now. Um, yeah, and that's when I was looking at greenhouse gas. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I'm wondering, since we are in the greenhouse gas area here, you know, reducing it, if we want to mention something about trying to encourage or maintain that the telecommuting that, um, you know, for businesses to allow that. Yes, um, the this place where that lives in the plan now um, is is more in our transportation section. Um, oh, and if you have it in there, that's good. And yeah, that's good. I, I will see, but that's a good note to just um, see if there's um, what we're calling it travel demand management services and strategies, but maybe there's something more specific that we could call out, uh, whether it's in initiatives or, or down below. Um, in this section, there's there's always different ways we can organize this. So, um, okay, yeah. thank you. About that, yeah, thanks. All right, um, Director, is that all, Director Maurer? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Director Levy. Uh, yeah, thank you. I I think it would be important in this section, also on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, to to say something about reducing vehicle miles traveled, reducing reliance on single occupancy vehicles. Um, reading it right now, it, it looks like it puts all the emphasis on electrification for in the transportation sector. And, um, you know, you've got um, where you can't see what my cursor is doing. You've got the, the land use component here to reduce growth in driving. I guess there you get the VMT issue, but I, I wonder about um, perhaps reducing reliance on SOVs uh, here. So um, we've, we've got that in there. That's definitely an addition we can consider. Thanks. Thank you. And Brad, I don't know if you wanna jump in real quick. I was looking at the chat and Director Shaw pointed out what looked like an error uh, the, in the third bullet, the region's waste shed. And Brad, you said that is the term you're suggesting and you would be happy to describe it. And Director Shaw said that she had never heard of it and neither had I. So just briefly, what is a waste shed? Uh, so basically you're on the right track. I mean, not the first person to see that term and think uh, watershed is the right answer, uh, but just, just think of it as sort of uh, the region system for both waste collection, uh, disposal uh, and opportunities to recycle and all the infrastructure that supports uh, the ability of the region to, to, to ultimately divert waste uh, that could be recycled from uh, landfills. All right, thank you. Andy, you wanna, you wanna continue? I can continue. Thank uh, you. So the, um, I'm gonna go now to page 22. 
uh, we're in the healthy, inclusive, and liberal communities theme. Um, at Dr. Cog, um, we've been host to an initiative looking at accountable health communities, or sometimes referred to as AHC. Uh, this is for staff to reconsider what we see as health services. So I'm going to go to scroll down here more. Um, so it related this outcome related to uh, the region's residents having expanded connections to health services. Um, we're reconsidering what we see as health services, that there are other health related uh, needs beyond medical interventions that are critical to improving better health outcomes. Um, and so we're proposing a new objective. Uh, that would uh, allow us to reflect some of this work and what we've learned through this initiative, um, as well as some uh, new supporting objectives under that and one move just down from from the objective above um, down here. And the other portion that we are proposing to add through related to the accountable health communities work uh, is around uh, housing security and quality of housing opportunities. This is something that's been explored through that initiative. And so uh, because it was already, we already had a, a good uh, outcome here around housing options, we just wanted to make sure to reflect that here as a supporting objective uh, rather than add anything um, substantial uh, above and beyond what was already here. Um, we thought that was a, a good way to reflect that piece of it. Um, Director Dale, did you, do you have an immediate question on this? Well, a, a couple of things. Going back to Commissioner Director Levy's uh, point, I, I know we want, don't want redundancy too much, but the whole idea of multimodal could fit in with greenhouse gases. And then on this point on health, uh, I can't go to, I, I'm, I can't control the screen, but I was thinking about social determinants, if that's addressed it. You know, we're thinking about accountable health system, social determinants are the big driver in that. When we're talking about food, housing, trans, those things. So those are my points. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Yeah, social determinants of health is definitely the language that, that is directly related to accountable health communities. Uh, we did not reflect it necessarily here. Um, uh, as a term of art that's well known, but um, that could definitely be something that's in this where there's this blue light blue text, this teal text, um, where we've got this objective narrative that we haven't drafted. That's definitely a place that we could in include a, a reference to so explaining the social determinants of health. I think that would be uh, useful and helpful and important. Thank you. And the last uh, uh, initiative that we're trying to reflect is, um, I'm going to go to page 25. Uh, we're in our vibrant regional economy theme. Um, we're um, trying to reflect an initiative, Prosper Colorado, out of the chamber, which is focused on access to opportunity. Uh, we already have an objective related access to opportunity, so we see a lot of the ways we can reflect uh, what we've learned out of Prosper uh, at the initi initiative level. Uh, but well, one thing we did want to add in here uh, as part of this proposal is a supporting objective related to not just the amount of job opportunities in the region as we reflect through our performance measures and, and elsewhere, but also the quality uh, of job opportunities and entrepreneurship opportunities. This is some language that we've, we've pulled from them um, to try and reflect here so that we can also um, um, take better care when we get down to the initiative level um, uh, to reflect that. So. Those are the three um, additional items, that, additional plans that we didn't get to last time. Uh, that's the uh, greenhouse gas emission um, uh, roadmap, reduction roadmap, um, the Accountable Health Communities and Prosper Colorado. So I'm gonna go back to the poll. So that's what we've got here. I will, I will, um, I'll let folks start answering this question as well. Um, so um, we've broken out that greenhouse gas emissions into two questions here about separating out greenhouse gases and then adding supporting objectives um, uh, under that. And then the other two are just related to those initiatives themselves. 
right, everybody, uh, go over to menti.com. Um, those of you who are participating and fill that out. If anybody's having difficulty with uh, filling out that poll, raise your hand and let us know. We're up to 14 people. This is like watching the people at the course field with those uh, games they do around the uh, around the track during between innings, like you know, toothpaste, toothbrush, and whatever that other one is. We're up to 19. Yeah, we're pretty close to where we were on the last slide. I think we ended up at 21 or 22. So it looks like we're, we're seeing, um, for the most part, folks on the, the, the side of three, um, like maybe the one that we, we may need to um, think about more as, um, or discuss more as this one related to um, Prosper Colorado, although well, that's still, Three. Okay. Anyone have any comments on this? Any directors want to weigh in on that last one? Why you scored it that way? Do we need any more discussion on it? Uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Oh well, yeah, thanks. I thought I I would just offer. You know the reason why I scored it a little bit lower, just to so staff has a clue. Um, it was really the um, the cult, the language around availability of quality jobs. I get accessibility based on what you know is within our purview and what we do at Dr. Cog, and I just I, I frankly just wasn't real clear about how this um, statement how we would operationalize that um, since we don't do economic development. So it was really based on that. Okay. Anyone else? Director Mulvey. Yeah, um, my concern about separating out greenhouse gas emissions has to do with the overall principle of trying to achieve a goal that's, you know, it's something that we want to do and it's something that we have as an objective in many places, but it's super hard to measure throughout the region. And there are a lot of variables that don't necessarily have to do with what we as an MTO do. And for example, we can't control the weather and how that might impact, you know, what the greenhouse gas situation is, you know, how it's measured. So we measure greenhouse gas, and but that's not necessarily what's admitted emitted by a vehicle based on our transportation policy and funding policy. So, you know, when we separate it out, it's 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 sort of an immeasurable. And I it makes me really concerned that it becomes a metric that we measure ourselves by when there are so many other variables, even though it's something we seek to attain and it's something we seek to change. So it's, it's a continual crawl in my side because I don't know how we can have that as a metric when as an MTO, all we can control is what we choose to do for public transit versus other forms of transportation that might cause greenhouse gases. We can't control, you know, what a plant does or a coal-fired facility or anything like that. But we're we're separating it out as an objective and a metric that we have no control over. So that's kind of what concerns me. 
Somebody somewhere has to start thinking about that as an objective. Thank you. Uh, Director Brockett? Uh, well, I'll, I'll just speak up in, in favor of the, the proposal of separating the, the greenhouse gas emissions um, out. I mean, you know, with um, all of these, uh, Dr. Cog doesn't have anywhere close to full control over them, uh, but we do have some influence uh, over them when they're in our nexus of, um, in our wheelhouse of transportation and, and land use uh, planning and such. So in there are a variety of actions that Dr. Cog takes that can impact uh, and lower greenhouse gas emissions, like multimodal transportation and encouraging you know, housing near uh, jobs and, and a number of other things. Um, and and uh, measurements uh, are an imprecise science, but are making more and more progress all the time. It's something that we do a lot of work on in City Boulder. So I think it's a great thing to have in there and for us to do the best we can to measure it and how our region is progressing in this area. Thanks. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Seitz. Thank you, and my apologies for being late uh, joining this. Uh, this was not on my calendar earlier uh, this week. Um, so um, I really quickly wanted to say I agree um, with Director Brockett. Um, arguably, um, Dr. Cog as an MPO deals with two of the three largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, obviously in transportation, which is now the largest generator, and then also in land use um, planning. Um, so it would seem to me, of course, this is in our wheelhouse to, to measure. Um, and if this is a goal of ours, um, and, and we recognize the significance of it, um, it's really hard to know if we're making progress without measuring it. Um, further, the state um, has set um, emission um, target reductions, um, recognizing those aren't codified. Um, at this point in time, um, but I think it, it would make sense for us to um, pull this out separately so we can, can chart our progress. Um, as Director Brockett says, the science may be imperfect, um, but there are models to use. And so I, I would recommend um, going forward with the proposal. Thank you, Mayor Seitz. Uh, Andy and Brad, uh, what else do we have on this? So the only thing I have here is just a spot where feel free to share any. I, I, I'm glad we've heard a lot of concerns and questions already. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to leave it on this slide so folks can continue to provide us some feedback. Uh, even even after this item, I'll I'll try and leave it active uh, for a little while yet today. Um, just if folks have anything that they they want to pass on to us um, that, that we should consider or look at more. Um, they can also reach out to us through the contact information in the memo. Um, but um, if there's anything um, uh, that, that we need, still need to address or any other questions uh, that we haven't answered yet today, um, given what time we have, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, any directors have any final comments or questions before we move to the next agenda item? And maybe Brad or Andy, can you tell me if you leave this up uh, this slide up as we go on to the next item, uh, directors can still fill that out while we're in the next item. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, here? that's the intent. Yes. Thank you. I, I, I don't have a teenager here to advise me on the technical nature of Zoom. So uh, that, that's good to know. Uh, with If there are no other comments, I want to move on uh, now to the next item, uh, which is an addendum to our agenda. And that's the discussion uh, led, I believe, by Ron Papsdorf. Uh, on the uh, state transportation funding bill that dropped uh, this week. Uh, Ron, do you want to start? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and directors. I'm happy to be here. Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Um, first of all, very sorry for the late addendum to the agenda packet for this afternoon's meeting. Things have been moving uh, fairly quickly, uh, I think, as many of you are aware. Um, you all last discussed this at uh, about a month ago at your April board work session and had uh, the bill sponsors uh, present to uh, introduce um, the, the broad strokes of um, their uh, proposed state uh, transportation funding package. Things have changed a bit over the last month. And you know I think we all indicated that we expected a bill to be introduced within a few weeks after that. Um, Legislative leadership and interest groups have continued to discuss uh, the proposal in the meantime. 
Um, we, when we sent out the addendum, we had a bill draft and um, kind of a bill summary. Uh, those were included in or the bill summary uh, that was provided by the bill drafters was included in the addendum packet. Uh, so hopefully you've had a chance to at least briefly look at that. Um, in the meantime, uh, yesterday evening, uh, Senate Bill 267 was formally introduced um, and we sent out a link to that bill uh, uh, to the to the board directors um, this morning, I believe. So that's now um, available. I'm sure you've all read uh, the full 190 pages, so I won't have to tell you anything about what's in the bill because you, you all have it memorized. Um, but for Thank those of you who haven't read all 190 pages, I'll do a very brief uh, summary <laughs> this afternoon just to <laughs> kind of start into the conversation. Um, so as, um, as introduced now, the bill does include a little over $5 billion um, over 10, 11 years um, through a combination of new fees, um, some stimulus money and some state general funds. Um, approximately $2.2 billion would be allocated to the Highway Users Trust Fund. Uh, so let me just share, pull up uh, a quick summary. I'm just gonna borrow from a couple of the uh, slides that were provided to us, if I can pick the right file here. Like many of you, I have lots of different um, files open on my screen at the moment. Can you all see that? It should be the bottom line slide. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, the, the proposal is to um, uh, make us a pretty significant investment in the transportation system uh, with the state, um, try to um, create a um, funding stream that is more sustainable and um, built on fees to um, accommodate the fact that vehicles are getting more fuel efficient um, and uh, the need to have continuing ongoing and growing uh, funding sources. So the funding sources here, this is a good slide. This was included in your packet. Sources include again about three point, almost $3.8 billion in new fees. Um, on lots of different um, uh, activity, transportation activities over the course of, again, 10 years, those would continue and grow over time. Um, 1.5, almost $1.5 billion in a combination of state general fund money and stimulus dollars, some state stimulus dollars, some federal stimulus dollars for a total um, funding package of um, just over $5.2 billion over that time frame. The uses are split among lots of different um, uh, buckets. Uh, $2.2 billion through the Highway Users Tax Fund. Um, again, about 60% of that goes to the state HUTF and about 40% is distributed to cities and counties uh, through the normal HUTF distribution formula. Um, the bill also creates a new non-attainment um, um, enterprise to help fund um, air quality impact, mitigation for air quality um, impacts and other impacts of transportation uh, projects. That's in just the federal um, non-attainment areas. So the Dr. Cog region and the North Front Range region in particular. Um, it does expand the existing state bridge enterprise to a bridge and tunnel enterprise and puts about $522 billion, $22 million into that enterprise uh, to make improvements to bridges and tunnels. Um, $85 million into the revitalizing Main Streets program. Um, this is an expansion of the package that we have, uh, we partnered with CDOT on over the last couple of years that included the safer Main Streets. It also includes the revitalizing Main Streets, which was small grants that CDOT made directly to local governments. Um, through that program. So this uh, adds new money into that program. Um, it builds on the multimodal um, options fund program that was created in Senate Bill 1 a couple of years ago. It now adds mitigation um, uh, a component. So some additional eligibility for that program. It puts $450 million over 10 years into that program. That funding is split 85% to transportation planning regions and MPOs to allocate to local priority projects and 15% to CDOT for CDOT to spend on state priorities. Um, it allocates $2.5 million 
um, in the first year of the program to the Front Range Rail project to kind of keep that planning effort going for the Front Range Passenger Rail project. It creates three new enterprises focused on electric vehicle um, infrastructure and fleet um, uh, transition and transit vehicle um, electric electrification, $734 million. And then um, some additional stimulus support, $395 million to backfill a, a two-year reduction in faster fee um, uh, to um, uh, Colorado residents. Um, and some certificate of participation payments for three years, uh, $200 million previously announced, again, of state stimulus support for transportation. Uh, finally, the eight years of the um, certificate of participation payments, $660 million, gets you to the $5.268 billion in the 10 years of the program. Those certificates of participation, just as a reminder, that's from Senate Bill 267, uh, where the, the legislature uh, through that bill authorized the issuance of um, uh, certificates of participation, leveraging existing state um, properties to raise money to invest in uh, the transportation system. Let's see, I'll go, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these slides real quickly. Um, they, um, since the draft and uh, with the new bill language, they have added some additional um, policy components. So a bit of an alignment with federal infrastructure, with a potential federal infrastructure plan that the Biden administration has proposed. So it does now include language that uh, would conduct a multi-agency review uh, if that federal infrastructure plan is approved so that there's a reassessment of the distribution of the funds through Senate Bill 267. Uh, based on um, any new um, significant federal funds that might come from that package. Also, at the five-year mark, uh, uh, would require a review of the general fund commitment um, to the program and um, would um, include language to review the electric vehicle and the road user fee uh, in year five to make sure that there was parity. Again, thinking about other funding sources that might come online from the federal government or otherwise and make sure that uh, there's a review of those sources. The fee structure, uh, quickly go through this. Um, the largest part is a road uses fee um, on um, gasoline that um, would start at two cents and then would increase, um, would increase one cent every year until it reached eight cents um, and then would be adjusted for inflation. Uh, a clean truck fee um, on diesel, um, again, um, would, go, would go directly into that bridge and tunnel enterprise uh, program. It would um, uh, mirror the road usage fee structure. So uh, would start at two cents and increase one cent every year up to the eight cent maximum. Um, there's a fee on electric vehicles, uh, the EV equaliz equalization fee, a fee on uh, transportation network companies. So Uber and Lyft rides, those are per, those are per ride um, fees. There are a lot of details about that, but they, they, they have different fees depending on whether the vehicle is an electric vehicle or if it's a, if it's a multi-passenger ride rather than a single rider uh, ride. There's a delivery fee, um, uh, as the name states on, on uh, deliveries, uh, a personal car share fee, um, a rental free, rental fee that just indexes the existing $2 fee um, over time, and then um, provisions to conduct a study on a taxi fee and uh, an autonomous vehicle fee. So those aren't new fees, but directs a study on pursuing those fees. Again, just so you can see um, the numbers, the HUTF distribution, the non-attainment fund uh, at 180, almost $184 million. The bridge enterprise expanded to include bridges and tunnels, uh, the revitalizing Main Street component, the multimodal options fund program, the allocation of two and a half million dollars to front range passenger rail, and then the other um, enterprises, the three enterprises related to electric vehicles, um, one for community access enterprise, really getting it helping uh, get electric vehicles into um, more disadvantaged communities and make sure there's an equity component there, a clean, clean fleet enterprise um, to help the transition of fleets to electric vehicles and uh, clean transit enterprise uh, to help 
transit agencies convert their fleets to electric vehicles. Uh, the non-attainment enterprise and the expansion of the bridge enterprise. So all of that is listed there. There's a very detailed table that I'm not really going to go into uh, too much about the allocations of the different fees. So I will state that while the fees in that in that previous um, highlight kind of showed the total fees, really the fees are structured specifically to each enterprise or funding source that they're associated with. So if you read through all 190 pages, you will see some of these fees listed a couple of different times at different levels because they're associated directly with uh, specific enterprises according to this table. Um, the last policy issue I wanted to highlight for all of you is that the bill also does include um, a provision that would allow transportation planning regions and metropolitan planning organizations like Dr. Cog to form regional transportation authorities uh, by resolution of the board um, and, and then seek voter approval for transportation funding at the regional level through sales tax, use tax, visitor benefit taxes. That's a kind of bed tax, uh, motor vehicle registration fee. This is very similar to a bill that was introduced uh, during the legislative session last, uh, last session, but did not move forward. The, I think the board has had several conversations about that. So that is a policy aspect that's included in, in the bill as well. Um, Probably for our local government members, the two most pertinent things, um, again, the, um, the multimodal uh, options fund, now it's multimodal um, and mitigations uh, fund allocation, according to this table, is mostly um, state general fund and federal stimulus money. Uh, one of the things we're having some conversations about and looking at is, are there implications associated with that? Uh, federal stimulus money, um, may have a, a pretty short fuse to it. We may have to invest that money very, very quickly. There might be some challenges associated with that. So we're having some discussions about that. I wanted you to be aware of that component of the multiple options fund, but it is over the 10 years, a significant investment in that program. Um, and then um, again, the bill does allocate a share of the gas fee uh, revenue to an expanded state bridge enterprise, that bridge and tunnel enterprise. Um, which, which now is CDOT money to, to accommodate part of that. There was a reduction overall from the draft bill that you all discussed a month ago in the HUTF, overall HUTF distribution, which did slightly reduce the amount of money then allocated directly through HUTF to cities and counties. Um, I think by about $143 million over 10 years. Um, so um, wanted to highlight that uh, for you. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll, um, I'll conclude. Happy to um, entertain any questions uh, from, and, and um, discussion from the board. Herman Stockinger, the Deputy Director of CDOT, is also with us tonight. If there are questions that come up uh, that get too detailed, uh, beyond my knowledge, I may, I may punt, to, punt to Herman. Thank you. Is Herman promoted into uh, the panelists uh, for questions? If not, Melinda, could you move them over? I just want to kick off before I go to Director Teal. I'm, I'll be very interested in learning, uh, not necessarily here in this session, uh, how auditable or how uh, structured these fees are so that they can be tracked and, and enforced, particularly, say, the, uh, ret the uh, delivery fee. Uh, to what does that apply? Uh, I understand if, you know, Amazon or or other uh, app bay app based uh, delivery services, but if I order uh, something from Denver Mattress or Lowe's Hardware Store and they deliver to my home, are they captured in it, or are we only talking in that delivery fee about uh, app based things that we can track and audit? Do you know? And maybe Herman could answer. Yeah, I, I believe it's all retail deliveries, um, but um, I will definitely punt that first question to Herman because that's a depth that I don't know the details of. All right, Herman, can you? Uh, you, you bet. Uh, and, you and when it sure, and when it comes to um, to a hundred ninety page bill, we, we all start with we think. <laughs> so <laughs> all right. I will I will agree with with Ron. We I I believe this is for all all retail deliveries. Okay, thank you. And pardon my clock chiming at the top of the hour. Uh, Director Teal, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. So, Ron, one of my questions that I've I've never heard answered properly 
is with the new fee revenue, it strikes me that, you know, um, every one of the breakouts we saw, um, it, it seems to kick it. Well, we had the amendment, um, the vote that went through last year that uh, said that the requirement to have a Tabor vote for new fees delivered that generate um, uh, a certain amount of money. And I want to say that was, you know, several million dollars. And in each one of these news fees, each one of those projections, it seems to be o over that amount. So, I mean, I, I certainly appreciate the out of the box thinking to create new fees. However, how, don't, aren't we just setting ourselves up for uh, uh, court challenges right out of the gate with this legislation? Because each one of these fees are gonna require a, uh, a Tabor style vote, aren't they? So Director Teal, um, I'm certainly, um, I'm not an attorney. Um, I didn't write the language, but I know some very smart attorneys were involved in, in writing the bill language and I, they are fully aware of all of those requirements and, and provisions related to fees and enterprises. Um, and I believe that they have done their best to structure this, this bill in a way to deal with all of those legal requirements. Um, now, does that mean that there won't be a legal challenge to provisions of this bill? Probably there will be, right? And I think that's, but the folks that were writing the, the bill language and putting this package together, um, I, I think have done their best to structure in a way that they believe complies with all of the, the state's um, statutory and constitutional requirements. Well, I appreciate that answer because you're the closest one to come to uh, no, there will not be a requirement for a table style, style vote on any of these. But you didn't say that either, Ron. No. <laughs> That's my biggest concern is that um, this just does seem to be willfully skirting the will of the people as established in uh, a, a general election vote. Um, so with that said, and then I'd just like to point out with that uncertainty in place until of course somebody can deliver an answer of certainty. With that uncertainty in place, it's $3.7 billion out of the plan $5.2 billion that we are staking this bill on generating revenue for on a question that still retains a great deal of uncertainty. So that's just the point I'd like to share with my fellow board members. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director. And I noted uh, particularly, uh, just for clarity, uh, Ron, on the, uh, let me go back to the, uh, uh, the presentation. One of those fees was a, um, a road usage fee starts at two cents. And as that per gallon of gas at the pump, did I, yes. I didn't quite, okay. Because that uh, Director Teal could be uh, uh, seen as, uh, sort of, uh, you know, to your point, as an a, a end run around the, an increase in the gasoline tax. So it's a two cent fee charged at the pump. Uh, and, and Kevin, I mean, it's a good, it is it not been unnoticed that we've gone from referring to it as a gas tax to a gas fee to now a road usage fee. I mean, a little yes. bit of a game of cards with language, if I may be so bold as to point out. Certainly. I've never known you to be bold, but you're welcome to, to be bold. It. Well, I've known you to be bold. I've read a lot of bold things you wrote, so, uh, you know, <laughs> I figured I'd be bold. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chair and Director Teal, just to kind of close the loop on that, I think as you read through the bill language, which I'm sure you will read every page, um, like I must do, um, <laughs> there, you know, the language is very specific about tying specific fees to enterprises and the purposes of those enterprises. And I think that, you know, at least the way they've crafted the bill language, that that is what they're trying to do to, to support the fact that they are fees. They're, they're raising a fee on a specific thing and tying specific uses of that fee revenue to um, mitigate the impacts or offset the impacts um, created by, by the use of the system. So that's how they're addressing that. Whether that stands up, you know, whether that stands up to any legal challenge or your perspective on, on the legality of that, I don't know. I, all I can do is explain sort of to the best of my knowledge how they've how they've approached drafting the bill. Well, yeah, and I appreciate that, Ron. It's just that, you know, the, the point of that initiative that came before the voters 
was to address um, the nature of the non-tabor in, inequity that we saw out of the hospital um, bed fee. Um, again, meant to resource and enterprise fund, um, you know, uh, not meant to be a bed tax, but meant to be a, a fee to resource a, a fund, uh, an enterprise fund. So again, thank you, Ron. I, I really do appreciate your, your very valiant attempt to uh, uh, take on that question. Um, just again, the pointing out that I am searching for a definitive no or a definitive yes. And um, it's been unfound up until uh, even after a, at least a good month's worth of discussion. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Brockett. Yes, I have a few questions. Uh, Ron, thanks for that expl explanation of the bill so far. Um, look, I haven't made it all the, all the way through all 190 pages, but you know, life goals uh, one of these days. Um, so the first one, the, the non-attainment uh, region enterprise, what would be the allowed uses for those funds and who would be deciding how to spend them? Oh, so, uh... Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Director Brockett, excellent question. I don't know that this has a lot of detail in it, but um, the, the intent of the non-attainment fee uh, or enterprise, as I understand it, is to um, allow CDOT to invest in, or this is the 187, to, in, to invest in um, projects to um, mitigate reduce air quality impacts and other impacts um, for the for those projects within the within the air quality non-attainment area that I referred to earlier. Um, that money, that enterprise is housed within CDOT, governed by CDOT, but I will say that um, in in response to some comments that I think the bill drafters heard from stakeholders, including Metro mayors and others, um, that the, the governing board for that enterprise will include a representative uh, from Dr. Cog and a representative from the North Front Range MPO, um, along with three other appoint gover governor appointees um, and then the executive director of CDOT and the executive director of CDPHE. Is that correct, Herman? Yes, I, I believe that's right. A couple of the agencies will have um, seats on it as well. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, and then, I'm sorry, director, go ahead. Yeah, I got a couple others, if you don't mind, uh, Chair. Um, sure. So, well, and just so that, and then in terms of what actually the money would be spent on, do, do we have a, a, a list? Are we talking like vehicle electrification? What what are what kinds of things have they said, or do we know? Um, Director Brockett, I don't have a precise answer for you. Um, I have not read in detail that full section of um, and what what are eligible uses in the bill language. Um, haven't gotten that that deep yet in the last couple of days. No, that, that's fine. Um, thanks for the answer. Uh, next one is, so of these funds, uh, which ones would Dr. Cog be responsible for administering a share of? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Director Brockett, so the, the funds that would be allocated uh, through the Dr. Cog process would be a share of the Multimodal Options Fund program. So that $450 million over the 10 years is again split 85% uh, through the transportation planning regions and the MPO. So there are 15 of those around the state, including Dr. Cog, uh, very similar to the multimodal options fund uh, that we allocated through our last TIP process, if you, if you remember that. Um, that 85% gets split among those 15, um, uh, those 15 areas based on a formula that's already been approved and adopted by the Transportation Commission. Um, the Dr. Cog region achieve, uh, receives uh, just over 60% of, of, the, of the 85%. So I think so that if I did the math right, it comes out to about $230 million um, to, to the Dr. Cog region over those 10 years. Got it. And so if this passes, would we consider doing a new call for projects to distribute these funds to? Uh, again, a very good question, uh, Director Brockett. I, as I alluded to earlier, one of the things that we're thinking through are the implications of um, 
that funding distribution to the multimodal options fund program. So if you look at this table, um, the multimodal options fund is, oops, I can't highlight just a column. This column, if you can see my cursor, and um, the, most of that $450 million is made up of um, 340, almost $341 million of general fund and stimulus money. Um, and the stimulus money is a, is a significant component of that. Um, over, over $250 million, I think, of that is stimulus money. Um, those federal stimulus monies from the American Recovery Plan Act uh, that was approved uh, by Congress um, earlier this year um, does have a spend by date of um, the, end of, the end of 2024. So to have any chance to make sure that we could spend all of that money by that deadline, I think we would, we would probably have to do a significant new call for projects uh, that we hadn't planned on, because uh, I don't think we'll have any time to waste, if that's the case. So those are some of the very detailed ramifications that we're thinking, we're thinking through. Great, thanks for that. Uh, last question. So are we going to cons uh, consider position on this bill at our business meeting in a couple of weeks? I see Executive Director Rex nodding his head. Okay, great. Well, then, I, then I will save the editorializing for the meeting when we're making a decision. But um, thanks for answering those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, we have two committee meetings. It's 5.30. They may, uh, we may spill over a little bit. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, Direct, uh, uh, Doug, uh, we're okay with that? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Director Mulvey. And thank you for taking me. I have to go to one of those committee meetings. Um, <laughs> my question is quick and I don't know if there's an answer. My concern has to do with um, what appears to be the potential compounding of fees to an end user consumer. They, for example, if we could go to the fee list page, I don't remember what slide number it is. The certain of the fees, that's it, thank you. Certain of the fees when applied, I, the TNC fee isn't defined for most folks, um, mm -hmm. but the delivery fee, TNC fee, road usage fee, and clean truck fee when applied to um, most goods and services would typically be things that uh, a retailer or um, anyone in the chain of distribution on a product, goods or services, would pass on to an end user consumer. And so it would really end up being borne by the population. And so that may not be the intended purpose. The intended purpose is really to have the user be the um, bearer of the, of the fee, the trucker, the person who's actually using the road. That is certainly what the intent is. So I wonder, if that's been considered, if there is an answer for that, if that can be discussed with the drafters, because it's a real concern when it comes down to impacting people who've been impacted by COVID, especially the most vulnerable in our population. So that's, you know, I'm reserving all other comments because it's a super long bill and I've got way too much on my plate. I'm trying to unload as we speak, but, um, that's really what's been concerning me and what I've been thinking about um, as I've looked at all of the previews of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Director. <clears throat> and Director Mulvey, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, one, not my role to defend the policy decisions in the, in the bill. Um, you know, folks drafted the bill the way they drafted it and, and the way it's introduced. I, um, I have I'm at least aware of estimates from the proponents for the bill that estimate that the average consumer will um, incur sort of about a $28 a year cost for all of the components of, of these fees. Um, I haven't verified that, but that, that's the information I'm aware of. I see Herman nodding his head that that's their analysis uh, as well. I would also just point out, and, and again, not defending the, the policy behind this bill structure, but you know, trucks are on the road because consumers are buying things, right? Trucks aren't just driving around on the roads because they feel like driving around on the roads. It's because we're all consuming things and products have to get from 
where they're made, where they're produced, to, to where they're consumed. Um, and the same with deliveries. And, and I think we've, you know, deliveries put wear and tear on the road system. And uh, we all are, a, a lot of us, me included, have been, you know, getting more and more things delivered to our home instead of going to the stores. And we're, you know, we're seeing more of that happening. So I think my understanding is some of the rationale behind those decisions, but your points are not lost on me. But thank but, you for that. Is If there's a resource I could look at for that calculation, I think it would help me um, really sort of reconcile that concern. Thank you. Thank you, Director, and thank you, Ron. Sometimes it just seems the trucks are wandering aimlessly, I guess. Thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that explanation. Uh, uh, Herman Stockinger has uh, uh, put in the chat uh, a, a response to a Director Teal's issue about uh, the fees and, uh, and the vote, and it'd be very good to read that. And Herman, maybe you could, if you could answer some of these other concerns that uh, Director Mulvey, for instance, just raised also in the chat, that would be helpful to move us, move us along in this meeting. Uh, next up, I have Director Odoricio. Thank you. I was actually looking at Herman's comment, and it yes. provides, it's a, it very confidently states, and I was going to say the same with George, to George, that these are fees, not taxes, George. All right? These are fees, not taxes. Um, I think what, what you could look at, I think the page that you actually have in front of us shows, and there's a few of the others, that the fees are designed to try to address the impacts of each of those. So you do have a nexus between the expenditure and the revenue source. And, and that's what's required with the fees to have that nexus between what is it that you're collecting and what is the, the issues that you're trying to address. So uh, I will say that, um, that aside from having some faith in the, and no pun intended about faith winner, uh, but having some, some, um, some confidence in the fact that the other bill sponsor, Matt Gray, is an actual bond attorney who deals with these things day in and day out for well over a decade. Uh, he, aside from that faith uh, in him and the folks that are around them, I can tell you that we've had folks uh, analyze this from business to labor, uh, to the environmental groups, to government. And uh, the folks, uh, I think we're seeing a whole lot of support for this bill because it's been vetted. Um, I mean, for crying out loud, we waited for this bill to come out next week, next week, next week for the last three or four months, right? Um, and I think it's because they were doing such a good job of stakeholding and vetting it and trying to make sure it is done in the most equitable and fair manner possible. Uh, I think that there's a lot of wins here for, for metro areas. I think there's a lot of wins here for rural areas, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're taking away from each other. This is the best opportunity that we have for a statewide solution than we've seen in a very long time and more so than in my memory and I think that that is important for us to be able to say that Dr. Cog supports this bill. Thank you. Thank you director. Uh, next up uh, director Seitz. Thank you chair. Um, so I just have a few quick questions um, and want to preface by saying Westminster City Council will be looking at this and taking a position next week. Um, but on first, first blush, which I know is a very long, we've had a lot of conversations about this, um, we're generally supportive. Um, I do have a couple of specific questions in regards to local government access um, to the electrification and the retail delivery um, fee kind of pot of funds, how will those be administered? And I apologize, I'm sure it was in here, but um, again, like my colleagues haven't read all 197 pages yet. Um, so I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a very a high level stab and then I will hand off to um, my friend Herman Stockinger to try to try to get into some of the details. So. Um, mm -hmm. Let me go back down to this screen. So um, the three electric electrification enterprises are um, housed within three different um, state agencies. So the new community access enterprise really focuses on electric vehicle infrastructure, charging station, that kind of that kind of infrastructure uh, will be housed and administered within the energy office. Um, the clean fleet enterprise would be housed and administered through the Department of Public Health and Environment, CEPHE, and then the clean transit enterprise would be um, housed and administered through um, CDOT. 
the details of how each of those enterprises would um, allocate funds, that's a detail I, I do not have a good answer for you, Director. Okay, um, Herman, I, you, I appreciate you, you that. Are, Herman might have a better idea of those. Yeah, I wouldn't have a better answer than Ron at this point for those enterprises. Okay, so that's great on electrification. What about on retail delivery fee? So the, the retail delivery fee, so I need to go to this table again, and it um, gets pretty detailed. So the retail delivery fee, um, I, I will call them fees, because I think the way the bill is structured, there's components of the individual fee depending on where it's going. So the, the retail delivery fees get out, portion of it gets allocated to the highway user tax fund, portion that goes to CDOT, a portion of it goes to the non-attainment font, to the non-attainment enterprise. Um, a portion of it goes to the bridge and tunnel enterprise. A portion goes to the multimodal options fund. Um, a portion of it goes to the city and county portion of the, of the highway user um, tax fund. Uh, and, and the rest goes to the commercial charging enterprise, the fleet electrification enterprise and the public transit um, uh, electrification enterprise. So this table shows you in your packet what the how the proposed fees get allocated among the different funding pots. If that helps you, Director. It does, and um, please forgive my um, I guess uh, relative uh, new addition to this conversation. But um, you were very clear with the multimodal fund. You know that eighty five percent of it's going to go through the MPO, and you know sixty some percent's going to Doctor Cog. And so I understand how that process will work for making actual decision-making on ex, um, expenditures. Mm -hmm. um, but at that level, um, I guess I'm not familiar um, at recognizing there's a bridge and tunnel and all of these different um, pots, but who's ultimately making the decision on which projects are moving forward? Does that, does that make sense? And I apologize if I'm not being clear. No, it, 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 make, it makes very good sense, Director. And, and for, some of the, for some of those I have, I think I, I have information that, that I, I understand. Um, some of them I have less. So the highway user tax fund, um, those portions, again, a portion goes directly to CDOT. CDOT decides how to spend that money, okay? A portion gets split plan. among cities and counties. And so of the, of the apportionment that goes to cities, each city gets a portion based on a formula. And that, and that city decides within constitutional limitations how to spend that money, uh, same for counties. So those are those are very those are very local and specific decision making authorities. The bridge and tunnel enterprise um, is housed within CDOT. It, those those funds would be invested by CDOT through the through the board of the bridge and tunnel enterprise, which is the same as the transportation commission. They just seat okay. themselves as the as the board for that enterprise. So they make the the allocations of those funds. Uh, the revitalizing main streets program would be administered by CDOT. Um, and they would, uh, it would be a grant, a grant making process. So similar to our TIP process, uh, CDOT would do a call for projects. Folks would apply for funds uh, through the through that program. Um, the multiple options fund, I think we've talked about, um, and how that gets allocated, and, and the TPRs make decisions about projects uh, through through their allocation process. <laughs> Uh, what am I missing? The non-attainment fund. We talked about the the board for that. I mean, it's 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 administered by CDOT, but has a board that has other voices there uh, informing and and making decisions about those investments. And then the the electric vehicle enterprises. Those are ones I'm less. I have less information about yet about how those funds will actually be allocated. I appreciate it. And I apologize to my colleagues on the call for me kind of being caught up on the different formulas depending on the different agencies um, and, and uses. Um, finally, I just want to say, um, kind of echo what Com um, Commissioner um, Odoricio just said. Um, you know, I've been on the periphery of these transportation conversations for the last seven years. Um, and while the need has only increased, um, our ability to meet that need has, has diminished. Um, and so I'm looking forward to this. I think it's very fair to ask people whose business model relies on our transportation infrastructure um, to pay a fee that is, has a nexus to that impact. Um, and so I, 
and, and me as a consumer when I'm purchasing goods that utilize uh, infrastructure, uh, road infrastructure as, a, as the way I'm get, receiving it to pay for that. So I, I do think that that's kind of fair. And even as a big um, tree hugger, I, I think just having electric vehicles, everyone kind of pay a little bit more um, is appropriate. So um, while my board will be, um, my, my council will be deciding next week, I am supportive personally of this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Seitz. And uh, uh, it's a, actually, it's a very good discussion. I think it needs to be had. And I see that in the uh, chat, uh, Herman is making some more responses. Thank you very much. And I agree with Director Maurer's uh, observations in there that we still need a lot of definition on these fees. Uh, Director Dyack, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ron, it, we, we've talked a lot with the tip about um, geographic uh, financial equity. Um, is there a way to sort of um, tease out um, how much projected revenues versus projected expenses this bill would, would provide for the Dr. Cog region? Um, sorry for the pause, Director Dyack. Um, I, I, maybe, uh, at, at least guess very rough guesstimates for some very specifically, right? We can, as I, as I indicated, we know what the distribution of the multiple options fund is because that formula already exists. The 85-15 split is in the bill. Um, so that, that we can calculate. Um, we can calculate roughly uh, the HUTF distribution to cities and counties um, and have a, pre a pretty good estimate of that. And we can say, okay, the cities and counties in the Dr. Cog region are gonna get this much of the HUTF distribution. So we can, we can do that. Um, the other ones get a little tougher um, because there's not specifics in the bill about how the funds will be allocated. So we don't know how much of the bridge and tunnel enterprise revenue um, that, that enterprise will spend in the Dr. Cog region. We just don't. We, have a, we, we, do, we do know that I, I think, and I think Herman will back me up, that at least CDOT's direction is that you know, their new revenue where they, have, where they have flexibility in this bill will be focused on implementing their 10-year plan. And those priorities have been established and, and are listed in a document. And they were, they were developed to try to get some geographic equity around the state. Um, you know, whether, whether you agree or not, those distributions are set. So, I mean, to the extent that they, they stick to those 10 year priorities, I think we, have a, we can at least have a sense. Um, however, this investment doesn't fully fund the 10 year plan. So again, so again a, little, a little challenging to get too much, too much beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, any other directors with questions or comments? If not, we can actually give you two minutes to get over to your committee meetings. Uh, I don't see any more hands right now, but I just want to give it a few more seconds uh, because this digital platform is a little different than being in person. Stop. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Doug, this go ahead. Doug. Yeah, just, just real quick, because um, I just got an email from, from one of the directors. I think, think she made a good point. Um, yeah, we are planning, uh, at least currently proposed to... Um, to take this bill up at our business meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, so I would imagine that there will probably be discussions around your council horseshoes about this bill too and, and, and commission horseshoes. Um, so it'd be great if you guys could take an opportunity to, to um, um, you know, the council has taken an opportunity to vote on this so that we can have an adequate um, number of folks who, who are able to vote in, in a couple of weeks. Exactly. Thank you very much. I know that Mayor Hancock for Denver has taken the position, but as a council, we have not yet. So uh, thank you for that uh, uh, clear uh, request. I don't see any other directors with hands up, So, and we have no other business here. Uh, so unless somebody has, oh, what happened there? Somebody did raise their hand. Oh, uh, Director Stolzman, go ahead, Mayor. Sorry, Director Flynn. I, um, I just was wondering uh, from Herman if we had a, if there was an anticipated time that they thought this bill would go through. I, I just know that their time time is running short. So if, if you could tell us a little bit about the timeline. Sure, I don't think it has been calendared yet, but the rumor is it may hit 
um, Senate Finance uh, Monday afternoon the 10th. And they also, there's the rumor that the legislature is trying to end session by the end of May. So between the 10th and the 31st is the range where uh, we expect this bill to be heard in a couple of committees and on two floors. Thank you. Is that it, uh, Director Stolzman? Yes, thank you. Okay, and our meeting is on the 19th. Uh, Director Baker, go ahead. Sorry for the last minute question, but I was wondering if, um, if we could ask about the programs, the allocations to the various programs in the local HUTF, can they only be used for that program? Are there options for them to be used outside of those programs for the HUTF um, local allocation? Um, Director Baker, I, I don't know. Um, there are there are constitutional limits on um, on the expenditure of gas tax and HUTF. Um, I I do not know if and I haven't asked the question. I haven't had a discussion. I don't know what other limitations there might be um, on the use of this distribution through the HUTF to the to the cities and counties. I would I would anticipate I would I would plan at this point that. You would you would use it the way you use your annual HUTF allocation as a local government um, uh, on on those uh, same transportation investments. Um, but I'll flag that as a question to to pose to the to the sponsors and the advocates for the bill. Thank you, Ron. Mr. Chair, if I may, yeah, I, I I believe that's correct as well, uh, Commissioner Baker. Um, and I think that's the reason why they're using the HUTF as the instrument because. It's, um, it's similar to how, how you um, allocate that money now. Okay, no change in other words. Excellent, thank you and thank you. I saw Ron, you were taking a lot of notes uh, for on these questions. Uh, Ron and Doug, it would be great before the 19th if we could get definitive answers to as many of these questions as we can and to brief them in the board packet the week before so that we don't use a lot of time on the 19th uh, going over questions and answers that can be answered in the brief. Uh, that would be great. So uh, I, any other directors uh, with questions or comments? I don't see any. Uh, and there is no other business for the work session. So how about if we give a, Doug, would a five minute break be uh, appropriate before everybody goes to their respective committees? Why don't we give them eight minutes? Let's say we start at 540. Eight minutes. Okay. I think that'll give me time to do everything I want to do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Herman. Good night. Hey, everyone. Good night. Good night.